Hi, in this video tutorial we're going to be covering CPAC 6 titled Determine the Speed of Sound in Air Using an Oscilloscope, Signal Generator, Speaker and Microphone. This is going to allow us to demonstrate uh, the ability to use an oscilloscope as well as the ability to use microphones, signal generators uh, and speakers in order to generate waves in air. Here we've got the experimental setup. It's reasonably straightforward. We've got a signal generator here, or function generator as they're sometimes referred. From this, we've got it plugged into a speaker. We've also got a copy of the signal being fed into the oscilloscope, so we can see the original signal on there. Here, we've got a microphone, which is just plugged into the other channel on the oscilloscope. We also have a ruler, which is going to allow us to measure the position of the microphone. I'm not going to cover how to set up uh, the oscilloscope. That's covered in many other tutorials which are available on YouTube, so there's no point in me duplicating that. The principle of this practical is reasonably straightforward. We're going to emit an audio signal from the speaker and pick it up with the microphone. Because the signal has to travel through air, there's going to be a short time delay. The signal will be delayed because it is travelling through the air at the speed of sound, which is reasonably slow. It is certainly slow compared to the speed at which the signal which will be travelling down these wires from the oscilloscope straight to the signal generator. That will be travelling close to the speed of light, um, or certainly comparable to that, um, so we will be travelling on the order of a million times faster than the sound passing through here. So, as the sound passes through here, short delay, which we will be able to detect on the oscilloscope. I'll set this up now and we can demonstrate that. So here I've zoomed in a little closer so that we can just see the oscilloscope screen and we can see the speaker and the microphone. I've got the signal generator set to uh, a few thousand hertz, about 15 kilohertz. This will allow me, uh, by having a reasonably high pitched sound, to have something which is detectable by the microphone but hopefully it won't get too annoying by having it playing constantly throughout this video. So I'll turn this on now. We can turn it up a bit, and now we can see we've got two signals on the oscilloscope. On channel 2, which is the nice, crisp, clear signal, we've got the input from the, the signal generator. If I vary the frequency, for example, then we can see that varying. The other one we can see, which is a bit fuzzier, is the signal that's coming from the microphone. So if I uh, twiddle channel 1, we can see that moving up and down. We can see at the moment with the current setup, these two waves as shown on the oscilloscope are approximately in phase. Um, they're slightly off, but if I tweak the position of this microphone a little bit, now we can see they're pretty much in phase. The peaks of uh, channel 1 are lining up with the peaks of channel 2, so the peaks from the microphone are lining up with the peaks from the input. As I move the microphone back, you can see that these waves have now fallen out of phase. They are now in anti-phase, in fact, the peaks of one lining up with the trough of the other. And if I continue to move this, we can see it moving in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, and so on. What we can also see is that the amplitude of the signal picked up by the microphone is getting a little bit weaker. And so that's going to be a limit, uh, although it's partially imposed by having the volume down. If I increase the volume, then we'll get a much stronger signal and we'll be able to do things a bit nicer. So why is this occurring? Uh, we've got a signal coming straight into here. We can see that as I was adjusting that, there was no change in the signal input coming from the signal generator. Um, the wave that is being transmitted from the speaker to the microphone has this delay that we spoke about in the air. As I increase that distance, we're increasing the delay, um, and so that time difference between when this signal gets here from the oscilloscope and when it gets there having travelled through the air is causing the relative phase of these two waves to shift. Um, we know that if we shift by one complete cycle, then because we've got time represented on this x-axis, then uh, that is shifted by one period. Okay? So uh, we can work out the period by 
measuring the frequency accurately from the signal generator in the oscilloscope. So we've got the signal from the function generator here. We can measure that accurately um, using uh, by setting the uh, time division and taking measurements on the squares. So if we want to know the speed of sound as well as having to know the frequency or the period, uh, we also need to know the wavelength and then we can use the v wave equation V is F lambda, um, so just the product of the frequency and the wavelength gives us that or uh, equivalently lambda divided by the period will give us the wave speed. So there's a reason this microphone is placed against a ruler. We know that if I move, so here we are approximately in phase, if I move it back so that we've gone through antiphase and back into phase again, then I know that if this distance has set us out of phase by one cycle, by one period, then that must be because I've moved it through a distance of one wavelength. So if I can measure the distance that I've just moved it through, then I've got the value of one wavelength. I can increase the precision of that by instead of measuring across one wavelength, measure across multiple wavelengths. So I can start somewhere here, for example, and that looks approximately in phase. It's a little bit hard to tell um, because uh, on this it's very hard to get the peaks perfectly lined up. So there will be an uncertainty, but by having a high frequency that will also mitigate that uncertainty because just a few millimetres one way or the other we can see that's clearly off. So we should be able to measure this accurate to a few millimetres. So from there I can take a distance measurement on the ruler, I can go through one cycle, two cycle, three cycle, if I've got higher volume I can go through further, but now this is getting a bit faint, retake the measurement, and so I can say, in this case, say approximately 10 centimetres is three wavelengths, uh, so one wavelength is going to be about three and a third centimetres. We can measure that more accurately in a moment. So in terms of taking accurate measurements on the ruler, what we'll want to do is pick a fixed reference point on the microphone um, and measure from the ruler each time. What we don't want to happen is the ruler to move. If, as we're moving it, we nudge the ruler, um, then our reference point has been moved. So I recommend using a little bit of blue tack or something just to hold the ruler down, and that'll prevent it moving uh, while you're moving the microphone. So in this case, I could, for example, choose the leading edge uh, from the microphone as the reference point on the ruler. So here I can see on the ruler we're at 12.4 centimetres currently, for example. And as I move that back, if I find this is where I need to take my next measurement, then I can see again from measuring on the front edge, so measuring from the same point on the microphone, that's now reading about 16.5 uh, centimetres. And so I know the distance it's moved is going to be the distant difference between those two values, and that will be whatever multiple of wavelengths I've got. Okay. So that's how we're going to take the measurements. I'll quickly take a couple of measurements now, and then we can work through the analysis. So just for the duration of taking these measurements, I've cranked the volume up a little bit, uh, and we've got this set up. So here we can see the input signal and the, uh, from the signal generator and uh, the slightly fuzzier signal coming from the microphone. We can see they're slightly not quite lined up, so I'm going to, just going to tune this a little bit more. There I think that's as close as I can possibly get it, and that's currently at 9.1 centimetres. I can get an estimate of the uncertainty just by moving this a little bit one way or the other. If I go about that far, then I can say I'm pretty confident that that doesn't count as perfectly lined up anymore. Similarly, I can go the other way, say I'm pretty confident that's not lined up anymore. And by looking on the ruler, I can see that's about a millimetre either side. So I can say this measurement is going to have an uncertainty of plus or minus one millimetre. Now I want to move it while counting the wavelengths and take a new position. So I'm going to go through there. We've gone out of phase and lined up again. So there's one, two, three, four, five. 
and there's the sixth. Here we can see the volume has gone down, uh, so if possible, no, I can't quite adjust that any more sensitive. So now I can take a new value, and again I can wiggle it a little bit one way or the other to make sure I'm happy that the peaks are lined up and that uh, I've got an estimate of the uncertainty at that position. So having gone through six wavelengths, the value on the ruler is now uh, 28.1 millimetres. And again, if I adjust that a millimetre that way, uh, well, maybe it's 28.2. 28.2. So if I adjust that a millimetre that way, that's gone out of alignment. If I go a millimetre this way, that's out of alignment. So I'm saying 28.2, and again, plus or minus one millimetre. Now, before I continue with the analysis, uh, I need to make sure I've got the frequency or measurement from the signal generator taken down. So without adjusting any settings on the signal generator, because if I do, then I've lost the frequency, I now need to make a couple of adjustments on the oscilloscope that will allow me to take those measurements. The first thing I'm going to do uh, is remove the input from the microphone, so I've got just the nice clear signal coming from the signal generator. This has been calibrated already, um, and so all I need to do is take the time measurement. So I'm going to adjust this so that I can fit in a few more uh, complete cycles. Now I'm going to count through a number of peaks, count what time that is, and that will give me a reasonably accurate value. Okay? The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to line up this first peak with the very edge of the grid that's on here. And now I can count through some number of peaks and some number of uh, some value of on the grid. Let's make sure it's nicely focused. So I can count all the way up to this one and measure how far it is from there to there. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 cycles. And that's giving me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I think that's 9.2. Nine point two squares, um, so we've got some little divisions here, which allow me to make it a little more accurate. And that's going to be maybe plus or minus uh, a fifth of a square as well. So nine point two plus or minus point two. And the value that the time division is on is point one milliseconds. Now we've got some data. We're ready for the analysis. So the equation we're using to find the speed of sound is v equals f lambda, where v is the wave speed. F is the frequency of the wave, and lambda is the wavelength. The frequency of the wave is going to be obtained from the reciprocal of the period, F is 1 over T. The period is gotten from the data which we read off of the oscilloscope. So we had 9.2 squares covering 10 cycles at 0.1 milliseconds per square. So the value for a single period is going to be the total time, 9.2 squares times 0.1 milliseconds per square, divided by the number of cycles, which was 10. That gives us 0 0.092 milliseconds, or 9.2 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds. I've also calculated out the uncertainty in that. Uh, so the uncertainty was 0.2 uh, is just from this uh, number of squares. So we've got 0.2 divided by 9.2. We had an uncertainty. We weren't sure, maybe 0.2 squares out of the 9.2. And that gives us 2.2% as our uncertainty. Over here, we're working out the wavelength of the light. Uh, so we've got the wavelength is going to be given by the difference between the two positions divided by the number of wavelengths we went through. So that's the 28.2 less the 9.1, and that was to cover six wavelengths, which gives us 3.18 centimetres as the wavelength. Uh, I've added in the uncertainty of plus or minus 0.2 centimetres. So we said there was about 0.1 millimeter, uh, one millimetre uncertainty at each end. But we've got two measurements there, one here, one here. And so that gives us 0.2 centimetres uncertainty in total, 2 millimetre uncertainty. We can then punch that into our wave equation. V is F lambda or lambda over T. I've just uh, I did it by just putting in the value of t we worked out here, but if you prefer you can do 1 divided by this t value and that will give you a frequency first 
and then do the frequency times the lambda. Either way is equivalent, and we end up with 346 metres per second. Now we're ready to do the analysis, so we've already hinted at that here, where we've got our uncertainty there, and down here from our t value. Um, so now let's work through how we get an uncertainty in this value. Quick correction on the previous thingy. Uh, we said that the uncertainty in lambda was going to be 0 0.2. 0 0.2 was the uncertainty in our raw measurements, which was the 28 point whatever and the 9 point thingy. Um, so it was that came out about 19 centimetres plus or minus 0.2. But then our final answer, because we took that and we divided it by 6, we also need to divide our absolute uncertainty by 6. So the absolute uncertainty in lambda is not 0.2, it's actually going to be one sixth of that, which is 0.033333. So now we've completed the analysis, we can work through the rest of the error analysis. Uh, this was based off of the v equals f lambda, or uh, lambda over t equation, and so because we've got either a product or a division, we will recall that regardless of which one of those we're using, that means we've got to do the percentage uncertainty in v is going to be the sum of the percentage uncertainties in the other values. So the percentage uncertainty in v is going to be given by the sum of the percentage uncertainties in f and lambda, the frequency and the wavelength, or equivalently the sum of the percentage uncertainties in t and lambda, the period and the wavelength. Uh, earlier we saw that the percentage uncertainty in t comes out as 2.2%. To work out the percentage uncertainty in uh, to work out the percentage uncertainty in lambda, uh, that's going to be the uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty divided by the value, so 0 0.03 uh, divided by uh, 3.18, which gives us just over 1%, but if we round it to two significant figures, it comes out as 1.0. Now, to get the percentage uncertainty in V, we just need to add those two values. Uh, so we've got 2.2 plus 1.0 gives us 3.2% as the percentage uncertainty in V. Now we want the absolute uncertainty, so we do 3.2% times by the 346, and that gives us 11 as our absolute uncertainty. Now normally we would truncate errors to one significant figure, but because the leading digit is a 1, we will keep a second significant figure, and so that's fine to leave as 11 rather than truncating it to one figure as 10. Because our uncertainty, our error, goes down to uh, not the tens but the singles place, that also means we can retain a, the same precision in our value of v, so we won't need to round this out to 350 either, we can keep this as 346 plus or minus 11 metres per second. So that's our value for the speed of sound in air.